residential solar and adjacent technologies of batteries, heat pumps, uh, EV charging, mm -hmm. energy efficiency are just revolutionary, amazing technologies that are so promising. I think the single most important thing we can do is to figure out how to reduce the cost. We got to just make it as cheap as possible. And the best way to do that is to make it faster. Faster to deploy. Faster to deploy. That's where a lot of the additional cost mm. comes from. Billy Parrish is the co-founder, executive chairman, and uh, really truly an industry leader through having created a company that many of you know as Mosaic. Mosaic has many firsts. First 20 year solar loan product, the first to finance batteries and solar roofing products. The first really across the, across the gap, as it were, to attempt crowdfunding for solar at scale. Often across the, across the front lines as the first in any industry, um, not only are you seen as a pioneer, but you get a lot of arrows in the back. Uh, we'll hear more about uh, both sides of that inevitable part of being a founder today. We'll also talk about the evolution of the solar industry through the eyes of an industry pioneer who, uh, who sort of unwittingly fell into financing solar through his social activism. Billy grew up in the upper, upper West Side of New York, a family of, uh, of entrepreneurial minded folks who've helped finance energy for a very long time. So in uh, unpacking the story, it's interesting to see Billy choose his own path. I look forward, as I'm sure you do, to better understanding where this industry is going through the lens of Billy Parrish. I hope that you love these kinds of conversations. And if you do, you're in the right place. If it's your first time here, please subscribe to the show. We've got clean energy leaders on the front lines of the energy transition, just like Billy, in more than 700 episodes at mysuncast.com. But for now, I want to encourage you to lean in as we tune up your skills, Solar Warrior. We're getting ready to dive into another powerful conversation here on Suncast. Billy, it's been a long time coming, but I am truly grateful to say welcome to Suncast. Thanks, Nico. Good to be here. I remember, um, I remember listening to, gosh, eight years ago, uh, Emily interview you and she joked about how, about your piercing blue eyes. And uh, that's the thing, fun funnily enough, that I remember when we met at the Sustainable Brands Conference, I think it was the first time I met you and you were speaking at that event. Trina Solar of all companies was, uh, was one of the few, um, was I think the only solar company at the event as an exhibitor. Uh, and just being taken by uh, you in your 20s as really a standard bearer, you were carrying the flag for the industry at a place that knew very little about renewable energy. Um, we've come a long way. We've come a long way. Could you tell me about how the influence of your uh, upbringing and your family background and how that led you to some of the, to some of the early life decisions that you made? Sure. So I had two amazing parents. They instilled in me, I think, a sense of right and wrong, which is kind of the foundation of, of my life and all of this mm -hmm. work. Um, I grew up next to Central Park, so, and across the street from the Museum of Natural History. So, you know, a sense of the wonder of the world. Across the street was the, the giant blue whale, I yeah. remember going there and looking up at this, you know, enormous animal. Um, so I think sort of a, an appreciation for nature and a sense of right and wrong. And then the biggest kind of turning point into this work was at a place called the Mountain School, hmm. where I went as uh, during a semester of my junior year of high school. And I read a book called Ishmael, mm -hmm. which had, uh, a metaphor for where we are as a civilization where it described us as a machine going off a cliff mm -hmm. and we thought that we were flying and actually we were in free fall and i remember that moment of realizing 
the kind of ecological crisis that we were facing was the first kind of big like moment of transition of like kind of getting off a, a pretty standard path that right. I was on. Mm -hmm. Did you in your early and into the teen years have idealized sort of heroes in your life or in your mind, folks that you looked to as? I don't know if there were individual people that um, that struck me. My my first thought of a career path was as a kind of muckraking journalist. Yeah, I wanted to shine the light on uh, stories that matter, hmm. and um, uh, so that I loved to write. I loved to read. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was sort of the first uh, way I thought about making a difference. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it, it probably wasn't until college that I got involved in kind of activism as another path for making change. And um, that was powerful, you know, at, at a campus where you had the ability to really change what was happening at that campus, organize with other students. And I remember... Uh, working to get Yale to make commitments around sustainable food mm -hmm. uh, and purchase fair trade bananas and coffee. And, you know, ultimately the food system at Yale uh, became very sustainable locals buying from farmers across Connecticut and the region. And so, um, you know, powerful to see the ability to make a difference. And I think that uh, uh, winning builds on itself right where you start to see success start to see yourself able to make a difference and that's really powerful were there any early signs of entrepreneurial tendencies for you not as a as a little kid you know i did mm -hmm. the bake sales and mm -hmm. uh babysitting and uh but uh i think the the foundation of it was my parents kind of giving me a sense of confidence that i could mm. do things and yeah uh, and also probably privilege of having the support system that if I failed, um, it was not as scary. Yeah. Um, yeah. I refer to it often as being able to fall up. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting to me, a lot of folks, the, this day and age, um, let's say sort of since um, 2018, 19, it's easy to um, bemoan privilege, right? Yet all of the luxuries that we enjoy are, think about, I mean, even if you don't consider Facebook a luxury, like it changed the world. Mm -hmm. And the reason that Zuckerberg was able to build Facebook was because he couldn't fall down, right? He was afforded a safety net. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that if one were honest with themselves and explored historically, like many of the great pioneers are that way. Like there are definitely hard luck stories and people that pulled themselves up from, from nothing. I wanted to, to know if you kind of look at your family and think about any noteworthy uh, elements of kind of how your family structure worked or even the careers that your family chose that might've been influential. Well, both my parents were lawyers. My, uh, my mom worked for Columbia University uh, and my dad did energy mm -hmm. law. So he, he helped finance uh, coal and nuclear power plants yeah. and um, did some early securitization deals, wow. uh, which I didn't understand what that was at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, I think the only career advice they gave me was to not be a lawyer. <laughs> uh, and again, sort of to follow my passions. But I think some of that must have stuck in my head. Yeah. Um, when you think now as the executive chairman about the nature of the problem or problem set that you're trying to solve, how do you describe that to folks who don't who don't know what you do? My vision has been pretty consistent for the last 20 years. And it's been around accelerating the transition to a world of 100% mm. 
clean energy for all. Mm -hmm. And my theory of change for how we get there has been to enable as many people as possible to be part of the transition mm -hmm. with an idea that the more people who are benefiting from the transition, the deeper the pool of support, the more people who will be part of driving us there. Yeah. So it's been about that uh, equity and engagement. How do we reach as many people? Mm -hmm. How do we make it easy and affordable and compelling for them to be part of the solutions? Do, does, it, does it bother you when people say that you dropped out of Yale? Do you, how do, you, do you like it? Are you in that category of folks that's like an entrepreneur, like lots of successful entrepreneurs dropped out of Ivy League schools? I think the thing that I'm happy about around that is that I got off the track. Mm, tell me about that. You know, I went to good private schools. Um, I, I felt like I was on this track to doing, you know, what I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I feel like dropping out was a way for me to find my own path. Mm. And it was a way for me to pursue my purpose as aggressively and uh, immediately as possible. You know, it came after my biggest wake up around the climate crisis and I just couldn't be in school anymore. And so I'm proud that I took a chance and uh, started working on something that felt more important than being on the kind of well laid tracks. Can you take me to that point? that point of no return where you kind of unequivocally knew that you had to leave Yale and go yeah. do this thing? Yeah. So the summer after my sophomore year of college, I got a grant from Yale School of the Environment to study with Rajendra Pachori, who was the chair of the IPCC, the International yeah. Panel on Climate Change in Delhi. And on one trip, I went with climate scientists that were working with him to the source of the Ganges River mm -hmm. up in the Himalayas yeah. in India. And the scientists had been studying the glacier for years. This is the source of the holiest river in India. Yeah. And they said the glacier was downriver the year before and further downriver the year before and that it was now retreating faster than they had predicted and that the source of drinking water for hundreds of millions of people was at risk. And that summer there were terrible floods and droughts that scientists were saying were related to climate change. And you know, I'm 21 years old and yeah. um, saw climate change face mm -hmm. to face. And it kind of connected for me how catastrophic the impacts were gonna be. The choices that we made, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it was like, a, that was my moment of no turning back. It was just saying, this is what I'm gonna spend my life working on. Hmm. And what a blessing to find that at that age. No doubt. Uh, and, you know, before a lot of people really recognized it as a problem. And yeah. uh, those first number of years working on this were so scary in that, we were in the like alarm bell ringing phase yeah. of the work where it was like, we were like, wake up. Like this is, uh, we're gonna consign our future to a, a, a terrible path. And people weren't even paying attention. No. They didn't even realize it was an issue. So that was a really kind of highly stressful period. Mm. Um, it's still scary now, you know, 20 plus years later, but, uh, it's gratifying to see people pay attention and all of the progress that we've made, you know, yeah. it does feel like, you know, emissions have peaked. Um, the energy transition is well underway and accelerating. So, you know, we're in a very different period, but um, gosh, those early years were tough. Was there a moment that you recall that sort of legitimized for your parents, this new path? Yeah, that was clear. Um, uh, we, uh, so I started something called the Energy Action Coalition, which was a kind of youth coalition of 60 yeah. different organizations working together on climate. And we ran a campaign called the Road to Detroit that 
was focused on getting the major automakers to make more hybrid electric vehicles, more fuel efficient vehicles. And uh, we worked with a bunch of Middlebury kids who ended up starting 350.org on that campaign. And and they converted a school bus to a biodiesel powered Hmm. kind of campaigning bus that we toured around the country on this campaign. I ended up taking it to North Dakota and uh, uh, it was around the time Rolling Stone reached out to me and they were doing a series on climate heroes and uh, took a picture of me with with the school bus in the background uh, and I had a two full page spread in Rolling Stone uh, and my dad was like, that's this is cool. Yeah, (laughs) you're on to something. Can't can't really argue with this. Yeah, right. That is wow. Uh, How that how did it feel for you? Was it surreal? Yeah, you know, I uh, was that that was around the same time as well. You were like student activist of the year, Mother Jones, like all these things, these accolades start boring. In. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like the 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 mission and the and the drive was so pure that like mm. I, I I feel like all that stuff washed over me. Yeah, like, it was just not about that. Got it. It was like nothing matters yeah. other than waking up the world and mobilizing our generation in particular. Yeah. One of the things that fascinates me about your story is, um, is one of the core strengths that you seem to have, which is the ability to get people to follow your vision and in numbers that are staggering. Um, early in what wasn't even a career, you were able to work with uh, folks who that now are household names and they weren't at the time um, and get tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people into the mindset, like this is something we can work on and we can do something about it. Did you have any formal or even informal training in, uh, in building consensus or activism or you see where i'm going with this i'm curious like what about your formal or informal training helped empower that how much of that was natural gift like when you think about what you leaned on there what was the structure no formal training i don't think i think it was an instinct around the need to build a movement Mm -hmm. Uh, i was a student of social movements. I read a lot of King and Gandhi and Otpur, which, you know, another youth movement from around the world. And, um, and I was, uh, to my theory of change, it was about how do we get as many people involved as possible? So I feel like a lot of it was just trial and error. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like we started the first climate change blog, it's getting hot in here, dot org. Yeah. Uh, you know, trying to we did a, a, a music album uh, where we got artists to contribute songs. Um, that was the Energy, Energy Action Coalition. Yeah. Um, and so it's been just trying different ways to make it fun and easy uh, and, and exciting for people to be part of the movement. I think that's been a drive for me. And, you know, I think it, it also connects to probably my deepest belief which is that we're all connected yeah. and mm. we're all part of where we're going. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, that that's where mosaic comes from. Mm. Uh, it's this idea that we're all broken in some way mm. and uh, that it's in our coming together that we become whole. I'm curious the shape your career began to take that led you out of Energy Action Coalition into other things. I'd love to know how you met Van Jones, uh, what took you from the East Coast to the West Coast uh, in the days that sort of created the formation of the person that would go on to found Mosaic. Yeah. So I worked for four or five years doing youth organizing, coalition building. And towards the end of that, I started getting all of these questions from Mm -hmm. the young people that I was working with around how do I build a career doing this work. Yeah. And I also recognized that the 
energy transition was unlike other social issues that civil rights movement, other social movements had, had to work on, where it wasn't just the hearts and minds thing. We actually needed to restructure the entire global economy yeah. to solve this problem. And so it needed to involve businesses. It needed to involve markets. Mm -hmm. And so I got really interested in this idea of green jobs. I kind of brought those things together, that right. there's an aspirational opportunity to actually create more jobs and wealth and opportunity and prosperity as we solve climate change. And that was just like, you know, you can see with my theory of change how that just like brought everything together for me. Right. So I got really interested in green jobs and the green economy. And I remember I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, running Energy Action Coalition, and Obama had uh, announced that he was going to run for president. Yeah. And uh, I remember I, I was taking a shower and this idea came to me of Obama in New Orleans announcing the creation of a sort of civilian conservation corps style program to put millions of people to work in green jobs. In green energy, yeah, green jobs. And uh, I, Van was one of the first people I reached out to, uh, Joel Rogers, Bracken Hendricks, a couple other people, and we formed this kind of group that started thinking about what that could look like. Mm. And we created a proposal to create a clean energy core yeah. and create 5 million green jobs. And we convinced Hillary Clinton's campaign, John Edwards' presidential campaign, Barack Obama's presidential campaign to all endorse this idea. This is in 2007. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when Obama became president, he brought in Van as the green jobs are to yeah. implement a bunch of that. A bunch of those ideas became part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, Amazing. which was like a big early shot in the arm for the clean energy industry. It certainly was. Um, and, uh, you know, we never got the like big branded, like we wanted people in green hard hats in every community across the country right. where people could see that government was enabling and yeah. supporting people in this way yeah. and An early uh, kind of green new deal yeah. yeah exactly and so we never got that part of it it wasn't at the scale i think obama didn't have the ability to do it as big as it should have been done right um but was an important win and uh and for me, that was also at a time when I was transitioning out of Energy Action Coalition. Mm. Um, I burned myself out. Like Imagine I, that. <laughs> I, I felt like I was carrying the weight of the world mm -hmm. on my shoulders, and um, uh, and I fell in love with uh, a woman, Wahala Johns, who was part of the Energy Action Coalition, and, uh -huh. and we started a family. And I moved out to Arizona, and I had a few really wonderful years where we had two little girls. I was able to be very present for their early years. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a kind of portfolio era where I was working mm -hmm. on a bunch of green jobs things. I was connecting, catalyzing, convening. I wrote a book called Making Good that was about making money and doing good and the overlap of those things mm -hmm. and, um, and not running any uh, organizations or companies or anything like yeah. that. And I, I tracked all of the different things I was doing. I had a kind of impact tracker. How? So uh, an Excel sheet? Yeah, it's a Google spreadsheet. And I was probably working on 15 or 20 different things. And yeah. again, not running any of them. Yeah. Uh, but felt like I was contributing and supporting a lot um, of different impactful initiatives. Uh, yeah. And Mosaic was one of those that I had started to work on with Dan Rosen. Yeah. And uh, it just started building on itself. Okay. And uh, how did you meet Dan? I met Dan actually uh, in New York. I was friends with his older sister, who was part of the Energy Action Coalition. Uh -huh. And um, I think Dan was 16 when we first met and uh, uh, very radical, like to the point where as a student activist, I was like the man, um, like not radical enough, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you know, an incredibly charismatic visionary uh, guy. And uh, we then connected later 
in Arizona, he had moved out there after high school. He didn't go to college to work with my wife and a bunch of the other, uh, my future wife and a bunch of her colleagues on uh, activism and, and work to transition the Southwest and tribal mm-hmm. economies from coal to clean energy. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we became very good friends and uh, Mosaic went through a couple different iterations. Uh, mm-hmm. The first like real business model we came up with was as a crowdfunding platform for clean energy. Yeah, And we kind of figured that out at a social business accelerator program called the Unreasonable Institute, yeah. which is now a global phenomenon, which has supported thousands of businesses and is an incredible community mm. of uh, change makers. Uh, but we were their first class. Yeah, like they wow. were just, they, they had just graduated from UC Boulder. I think they were 22, 23 yeah. years old and like really figuring out what they were doing. Um, but it was, as part of that incubator that we kind of refined our first business model. And we were, I think, the first platform to kind of crack the nut on enabling people to invest in clean energy and earn a rate of yeah. return on that investment. Yeah, I mentioned in the intro, it was like time uh, of, you know, Kiva.org was like the, they had done the, they had kind of bushwhacked and cleared the way and yeah. proven like, you can raise money to invest in you know, microfinance in Africa yeah. uh, for people you've never met. And here I remember uh, when you guys did the project um, um, for with Ella Baker Institute and the work that you guys did with Van in Oakland. I was living in Oakland at the time. And I remember being like, I want to invest in this. And it had already closed. And I was like, oh, I missed it. I wanted to invest in the first crowdsourced solar project. Uh, there's a fun story about how that project came together. I'd love for you to share. Yeah. So we were trying to figure out where to do our first projects. We really borrowed from the Kiva model of yeah. make it possible for people to lend money and just get their money back, not earn a rate of return. Yeah. Cause that involved a whole lot of securities laws right. that were complex. Took us some time to figure out. Uh, and we were struggling. We uh, had some false starts in DC and Flagstaff where mm. we tried to develop our first projects and couldn't get them done. And I remember Dan and I were, uh, we'd done a workout and a sauna at the Berkeley uh, YMCA. And we got out of that and we were like trying to figure out like, is this gonna work? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I got a call from Van and he told me that he had just gotten off the phone with Prince, the musician, and uh, that Prince wanted to do something around green jobs in Oakland. Yeah. And Van said, should we do something together? Yeah. I was like, well, hell yeah. Where do we put this money? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> Were and, you like, which Prince? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he had started a group called Ella Baker Center, yeah. uh, as well as Green for All. Mm-hmm. And so we worked with the two of those organizations to design this program called uh, Oakland Solar Mosaic. And we matched $250,000 anonymously given by Prince yeah. with $250,000 of crowdfunded uh, loans. Yeah. And... Uh, built a bunch of solar projects with uh, incredible local social justice community-based organizations in Oakland. That was how we got our start. Yeah. I can say having been there, like in the room where it happened, not quite in the room. I remember you guys at the time were at um, it, working with Emily and Sfun Cube. And, um, and it was this exciting time in Oakland where like nobody knew where this was going. And the funny part was that everybody, Real Goods and everybody else, um, Akina, Solar City, uh, we were all trying to figure out residential. And here you are like financing not for profits and commercial buildings, which was just like a completely different, like no, there's no, there's no underwriting category, there's no rating system. Do you remember some of those early conversations that helped you navigate what's working, what's not working, what what Wall Street will and won't do? Yeah, so we took two really challenging problems 
One was how to make crowdfunding work. Right. We had to spend millions of dollars with lawyers and figuring mm. out pathways to make it so that people could not just get their money back, but could actually earn a rate of return. Right. So that was a lot of securities law. And we figured out some pathways that, that worked for that, um, but didn't quite scale. Um, and then on the other side, it was figuring out how to do commercial solar finance, which there's no credit scores for commercial buildings. Yeah. The projects take a lot, a lot of time. They require bespoke negotiations and contracts. And um, so, you know, we were able to kind of make it work for a couple of years. Uh, you know, we did, I think, 15 million worth of projects uh, from thousands of investors. Yeah. Um, but I think a big lesson from that time was that taking two hard problems uh, is at least one too many, I think. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I'll never forget, we got a call from somebody at the SEC who wanted to look into what we were doing around crowdfunding. Yeah. And this was at a time when we were expecting the crowdfunding laws to evolve and open up. The mm -hmm. Congress had passed something called the Jobs yeah, Act, yeah. which was supposed to unleash this new era of mm -hmm. crowdfund investing. Obama signed it into law, but um, it just wasn't implemented. Yeah. Um, and uh, the SEC basically uh, had, had already enabled uh, Prosper and Lending Club yeah. to do crowdfunding in a certain way. And they sort of said, we're comfortable with that fact pattern and, and way that they're doing it. But if you don't follow sort of exactly that fact pattern, um, you know, we're, we're not open, yeah. um, was effectively the message that we got. So we had to pivot the business yeah. and it was a double pivot where hmm. we said, we can't do crowdfunding. So we need to find institutional investors. Um, and commercial it's is really hard. hard. And so, <laughs> Uh, we, 20 years later, still is really hard. Still is really hard. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know that anybody has Nobody. yet cracked the nut on it to do it in a really Not scalable, the way you did profitable it. way. Not the way you did in Resi. Yeah. And so we had this brand, we had a platform that could faci facilitate investors and borrowers. Uh, we had a bunch of installer partners. And so, uh, we interviewed 50 different residential solar contractors. We, uh, brought on a guy named Ben Tarbell, uh, who's an amazing. I couldn't believe that when I first heard Ben was on your team. That yeah. It was like your project. Yeah. Yeah. He was our, our head of product. Yeah. And so he was really the one who helped us find product market fit yeah. for residential solar. Yeah. And, uh, you know, largely he, but all of us, we interviewed all these contractors and, uh, we heard from them that residential was growing, but that the financing wasn't there. Yeah. There was some lease and PPAs that were being developed by Sunrun and Sun Edison and Solar City. Rob Bank at that time was also yeah. really trying to figure it out. But most residential installers didn't have financing that they could bring to their customers in an efficient way. Uh, the the best loan product on the market was from Admirals Bank. Mm -hmm. And it was like a 12 year product very clunky process where, you know, you'd have to call them and it would take weeks to get through a credit yeah. approval process, very low approvals. Um, and at a 12 year loan, people couldn't save money switching to solar. So again, go back to my theory of change, making it easy, affordable for people yeah. to, to do it. That was not possible yeah. for residential solar. And so we designed a 20 year solar loan product. We had to stretch out the term of the loan long enough so that people could save money switching yeah. to solar. And then we designed the industry's first fully digital point of sale credit application process so that a contractor could meet with a homeowner, they could look at the terms of the loan, and they could get through that process yeah. in a couple clicks in one sitting. And that dramatically uh, scaled yeah. the residential solar industry. So. You know, we have now 4,000 
solar contractors and home improvement contractors across the country who use Mosaic's products. And, 10, 10 billion, is that right? Uh, we're in, over 15 billion. Over 15. Yeah. In it, loans funded. In loans funded, mainly in residential solar. And um, we've made it easy and affordable yeah. for people to be part of the energy transition. The thing that stands out to me the most about Mosaic is those two words, right? Back to your theory of change. Like the guiding principle has not been, um, we want to finance solar. It was, we want to make solar easy and affordable. And the vehicle was, well, we got to help them get access to capital. Yeah. So crowdfunding didn't work, um, for better or worse. Uh, you had built all the tech stack to do crowdfunding well. You right. could have gone and competed in any number of verticals. You chose solar. Um, how did you find those early investors who were willing, not crowdfunded, early investors willing to back this idea? And can you talk about the process of trying to standardize the this risk scoring framework for uh, essentially unrated assets? Yeah. So, you know, I... I give a lot of credit to Michael Grossman uh, at New Island Capital, who was the first one to put capital behind our residential solar strategy. He gave us a, a small kind of mezzanine loan to mm -hmm. start making those loans. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then a group at Partner Re, which is a reinsurance company, said, you know, we'd like to dig in with you on this. And we worked with them and mm -hmm. designed a a credit uh, box and started originating. They started buying these loans. And uh, and then that started to grow. Uh, then we started uh, scaling and I will, I'll never forget the meetings with the rating agencies mm -hmm. where we were trying to figure out how to securitize these loans. We said, yeah. this is where we need to get to, to make this really affordable and a scalable, financing product and rating agencies look at data. Yeah. That's how they operate. <laughs> and we were bringing them 20 year solar loans that where we had two years of performance history. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we had to work with them to say, you know, here's, here's the data that we have so far, but uh, build a qualitative story looking at proxy right. data from home improvement mm -hmm. and mortgage and in utility. particular uh, and saying, you know, it should be between these two asset classes. Mm -hmm. Home improvement uh, is typically shorter term, often unsecured, but purpose built for a homeowner to make a home improvement. Right. Solar should be better than that, yeah. right? Because it is saving customers money. You know, a home improvement loan that customer, that's a negative cash flow uh, item right. for them, right? Um, that monthly payment isn't against anything. Whereas residential solar, most of our customers save money. So it's actually cash flow positive. So right. we're able to say, you know, it should be better performance than home improvement, maybe not as good as mortgage, but has a lot of similar characteristics to mortgage. Uh, and, you know, we were able to get you know, a not very good rating, but a just passable rating to get our first securitization deal done in 2017. Um, and we've now done 20 securitizations. Um, and it's become one of the biggest sources of financing for the industry, so. How uh, instrumental or not was your father's experience in energy securitization as you started to get into this process? Oh, I, uh, so the securitization deals he did were on music royalties. So it was like okay. uh, Bowie Bonds okay. and uh, How Metallica, where they would take the expected future royalties mm -hmm. from yep. the catalogs of these artists yep. and they could basically bring forward those cash flows and give you know money to the musicians now yeah. and then sell off the future cash flows from right, those. Yeah to to investors um so uh really different uh, yeah and i think i didn't even understand it so you know it's fun to come talk to him later and say hey you know we're doing securitizations now um so it was, all, it was kind of like a, an afterthought or an a, a post 
sort of like a Thanksgiving conversation. Like yeah. you won't believe the kind of stuff that we're working <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, totally. Huh. How interesting. Yeah, I, th I think even I, I would have assumed that, um, you know, I wonder how, for a lot of entrepreneurs, I wonder how influential are the entrepreneurs in their lives? And I find myself not going to the people that you would logically think I would ask for advice and input from, mm -hmm. right? In the moment where I could most use it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like when you hoard all those books and then in the moment that you need to learn about structured finance, you go to investopedia <laughs> instead of the books and the professors um it's kind of it's one of it is a it is an awkward um thing like that what's your learning process look like so my daughters will laugh because uh i talk about growth mindset with yeah. them a lot carolyn dweck yeah thank you <laughs> um i i'm just a big believer in continuous learning yeah and I think I've often learned by doing. Again, you know, I didn't have any formal training in securitization or finance, but it's just learning through conversations, through mm -hmm. necessity. Yeah. Um, and I, I did a, uh, I organized the program with my daughters when they were growing up that we called 52 Weeks of Learning, which was an idea of us every week picking something new that we wanted to learn. And we would sort of talk about it and then work on it over the course of the, the week and mm -hmm. then, you know, talk about what we learned and how that went and what we wanted to learn the coming week, uh, every weekend. And what are some examples of young parish daughters? Learning, um, learnings? I mean, it was really fun when they were little because the things that you can learn as a, as a little kid are, are amazing. I mean, yeah. their minds are, are so, uh, uh, pliable and powerful and you know so it'd be things like riding a bike mm. or um uh uh for me a lot of it was like i was this i was a first time entrepreneur so it was yeah. like how do you do a good board meeting yeah. um so you know it'd be like i would talk to people i would you know go online mm. um you know because we had an upcoming board meeting i'd yeah. listen to a podcast or something and uh you know, and it was fun to then talk to the girls also yeah. about like, you know, that kind of stuff and retracking your learning in a spreadsheet. How do yeah, you think? yeah. I love Google uh, <laughs> tools, spreadsheets, docs. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it's fun to look back at those uh, and and talk to them about it. Um, we don't do it anymore. They're they're 16 and 14 mm. now and still learning so much. But um uh got hard to uh stick with family meetings and uh do you still set those goals for yourself on a weekly basis uh i still have a uh similar work plan to what i've been using for 15 20 years where i do have weekly goals and i track those and yeah most mornings i i wake up and i'll look at that and i'll think about what I want to accomplish that day. And sometimes it's a learning goal. Um, where, so, where do you track that now? Uh, still in, I've got a Google doc where I track that, but I find that in the morning writing down yeah. the, the goals for the day mm -hmm. is, is helpful. There's something about the like physical writing of it that, uh, that helps. In the early days of, building a team, building a business, revolutionizing an industry in the way that we were able to offer products and services to homeowners. What were some of the things that you remember recognizing as weaknesses that you needed to strengthen? And how did you go about surrounding yourself with, the, with that, either the learning or the people? I think the most important lesson that I learned was the importance of building a great team. Yeah. Uh, I love the book, Good to Great. Mm -hmm. And there's a chapter in there called First Who, Then What. Yeah. And often when I'm talking to people who are trying to figure out what they want to do next, I, I remind them of that and I ask them to think about who are the two or three people you most want to work with. Start there. Yeah. Figure out what you can do with them, together with them. 
Uh, but in the context of a company, again, you know, I, I'm sort of a generalist. I, I didn't have a lot of the specialized knowledge that I needed. So finding and recruiting people with really deep subject matter expertise to the team was the most important thing. And, you know, I remember, you know, a couple of years ago, sort of looking around and realizing that our leadership team had almost entirely people who had 20 or 30 years of really deep subject matter expertise yeah. around consumer lending or building software technology or clean energy or, or other things. And, um, and also people uh, who were mission oriented mm -hmm. and collaborative. You know, I just, uh, I love building teams. And for me, that feeling of working with an amazing group of people on something that really matters is, uh, is just where I wanna be. That's my flow state. So, um, you know, I feel like for most of Mosaic's history, we've, we've had that kind of feeling where just like, really good vibes of people being excited to be part of this really important mission, working with really amazing people. And, you know, there, there's kind of a mosaic diaspora at mm -hmm. this point. A lot of people have worked at mosaic and are now working in other parts of the clean energy yeah. industry and like at trade conferences, you know, we'll have like reunions yeah. and like a lot of people come yeah. and uh, I think still that's cool. Really value the other people that they worked with in their time at Mosaic. So I'm yeah. proud of that. Was there any particular framework that you found? And I'm asking on behalf of all the rest of us who are trying to hire good people that you found that is helpful for hiring at scale. So when I'm interviewing people, I usually spend the first 20 minutes of the conversation just asking them to hear their story. Yeah. So ask, you know, I want to understand where they're coming from. And are there go-to questions that you use for that? Uh, yeah. What's your story? <laughs> I'd love to hear your story and particularly the couple turning points in your career mm -hmm. uh, and what you, why you made the decisions that you made. And what are you looking for? I want to understand what's important to them. Yeah. Why they make the decisions and also to understand the trajectory that they're on. Mm. Um, because we're, you know, even though we have, um, uh, non-linear career paths, often there's there's some sort of direction that people are heading in. There's mm -hmm. a purpose, there's a, a set of motivations right. that drive them. And so you can usually uh, see that. Um, uh, and it, you see how they think. Um, and, then, and then I often will ask, well, sort of what's most important to you going forward in yeah. this next period of life? And And then I try to assess, you know, is that a match for this role that we have in mind? for them. Very cool. Um, I heard once also that um, you wanna admire the people yeah. that you're hiring, bringing onto mm. the team. So that's all, all, all often, you know, it's a sort of an instinctual thing. But yeah. It's like, is this somebody that, that I admire? Well, for those of us who admire you, what is most important for you moving forward? You're now executive chairman, you're no longer, you're blissfully out of the role of CEO. <laughs> Where are you putting your time? So I think of my purpose as being around two interrelated things, uh, love and climate. And I say interrelated because a lot of my uh, work on climate comes from a place of love, mm -hmm. of loving uh, nature and the world and yeah. loving my kids and other people and you know wanting uh, a healthy future and present for all of them. And the love is also a uh, love of myself. And um, I did a, a year long leadership program called Rockwood uh, that helped teach me, uh, it, the program was focused on leadership from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And it's the sort of uh, oxygen mask uh, metaphor from planes where it's like, if you're not healthy and functional, you can't be a powerful leader in the world. And, um, you know, I had a, almost 15 year run leading mosaic and and that's hard and i've got some healing yeah. to do so mm -hmm. you know i've got some self-discovery of who i am outside of my family and my work that has been fun um uh so 
Uh, so there's some healing. Yeah. Um, there's reconnection with my family, mm -hmm. uh, with other friends. That's part of that as well. Um, and with my role at Mosaic, I'm now executive chairman. And so I'm less involved in the day-to-day -day operations of the company. Uh, and I'm much more focused on the industry broadly. Right. And it's really fun because, you know, I felt like I had mm. gotten into the competitive dynamics yeah. of the industry. And um, I'm now collaborating mm. with a bunch of our peer companies that, you know, are competitors in one way, but in most ways, we're trying to accomplish the same goal yeah. and we're feels, facing the same challenges. Feels like you're in that moment again, post Energy Action Coalition, where you're tracking the 15 things that you're contributing to, but not leading. Yeah. Um, what are the most important of those things? Where do you see you can have the most impact uh, in that leadership area? And I want you to reflect on kind of what are the core structural problems that we still deal with that you're trying to address. Yeah. So residential solar and adjacent technologies of batteries, heat pumps, uh, EV charging, mm -hmm. energy efficiency are just revolutionary, amazing technologies that are so promising. And uh, I think the single most important thing we can do is to figure out how to reduce the cost. Yeah. We got to just make it as cheap as possible. And the best way to do that is to make it faster. Right now, in faster the, to deploy. Faster to deploy. That's where a lot of the additional cost mm. comes from. Yeah. Uh, a really useful comparison is residential solar in Australia versus residential solar in the US. Yeah. In Australia, you sign up for solar, it's installed in the next couple of days, connected to the utility grid, and you're benefiting right away. Right. In the US, it takes six to nine months typically after you sign up for solar that's ludicrous it's months of permitting months of interconnection so the permitting is with the local cities or yeah. counties the the interconnection is with the utilities mm -hmm. and both of those processes take months on average mm. and so all of that flows through to cost of capital cost of labor cost of customer acquisition. And all of that leads to solar in the US being three to 350 a watt unsubsidized yeah. and a dollar a watt in Australia. Yeah, And so there are a few different initiatives that I'm focused on that I think have real potential uh, to bring down the cost and improve the customer ex experience for people. Again, easy and affordable yeah. for people to, to be part of the energy transition. The first of those is uh, solar app mm -hmm. and permit power. So six years ago, Andrew Birch, founder of Sungevity, now Open Solar, uh, wrote an article for Green Tech Media that kind of shone a light, a shined a light on this issue and he basically broke down the cost of residential solar and said, the biggest part of this is the permitting challenge. It just takes months. And so he sort of catalyzed this and we helped convene this group to yeah. create a solar app, which is solar instant automated permitting. Uh, and- It's the equivalent of over-the-counter permitting for solar. That's it. Yep. And uh, that was six years ago. Solar app now has issued almost 50,000 instant permits yeah. across the industry. There are uh, over 200 cities that yeah. have uh, integrated this into their processes. And uh, two states, California and Maryland, have mandated that cities and counties use automated permitting. Right. Uh, there are six states that have grant programs to support cities and counties to use automated permitting. And so we have a goal to get this nationwide. Yeah. Uh, and I think this, there is an opportunity in, for the whole industry to rally around this, work with their local cities, counties, state legislatures. This is a win, 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 win type of opportunity where 
uh, it's non-political, right? Yeah. Like everybody wants it to be easier right. to to build, and uh, and we've got very little political opposition around it. So it's just like it's a huge win. The the numbers behind it that I think are important for people to understand. Um, I love rewiring America's frame of we need to deploy a billion electrical machines. Yeah. 42% of energy related emissions in the US come from decisions we make at our kitchen table mm. on how we heat and power uh, our homes uh, and how we get around. So the billion machines, it's 350 million vehicles mm -hmm. and then 650 million devices in the home. Yeah. And that's solar, batteries, heat pumps, smart panels, Stove tops, uh, stove tops, exactly. Uh, hot water heaters, mm -hmm. things like that. And most of those things require a residential permit. Yeah. And uh, for solar, that whole permitting process and the months of delay and time it takes adds, uh, SIA estimates that it's $7,500 per project and effectively wasted cost. So, uh, for main panels, EV chargers, batteries, it's not as much, but still adds significant time and cost. Yeah. So if you think of the 650 million devices in the home that we need to deploy, uh, at least half of those require a residential permit. Yeah. So call it 300, 350 million that require a permit at a couple thousand dollars of wasted cost per permit. Yeah. That's a trillion dollars of waste in the energy transition that can be solved by automated permitting. So solar app now works for solar and batteries almost everywhere nationwide when cities and counties adopt it. When they adopt it, yeah. But we're now we need to get it adopted everywhere. And then we're also going to expand it to include heat pumps and EV chargers. What's required? to get these cities on board? What do I need to do in Durham for a solar app to be accepted? So there are two paths we're working on. One is the kind of ground up, getting cities and counties locally to adopt it. And there you need to build a coalition and, and, a, and find a champion, whether it's the mayor, mm -hmm. um, somebody in the building office who can be a champion yeah. for it. Um, solar installers are great champions because they're the ones who really feel this pain on a yeah. daily basis mm -hmm. where they're, you know, it's taking months. They're the ones who are absorbing these costs. The homeowners who are getting solar also feel it, but for them, it's a one-time thing, right? It's like, why did it take me three months to right. get my solar uh, or six months after the interconnection delays and all yeah. of that? Um, but the installer is dealing with it every day. So, you know, we're really encouraging installers to work with their local mayors, building departments and say, hey, let's, you know, let's shift from this manual paper-based process that uh, to an instant automated thing. Have you guys put together any sort of a toolkit that we could distribute to installers? Make yes. sure they we have some basic resources. We need to build more of those. Yeah. Um, but we have some basic resources for that. Uh, and then secondly, we're working with state legislatures to pass laws to mandate it. Yeah. So there's sort of well, a, yeah, a top, top down, down and a mm -hmm. bottom up approach. It does seem like as well, we could correlate the million plus homeowners who have solar through Anya and Solar United Neighbors and the installers, right? How do we connect those installers to say, hey, by the way, let's check in with Solar United Neighbors. There's probably a hundred homeowners in your neighborhood, in your area that we could get to sign on to this letter, that we could get to show up at a city council meeting like that. Yeah. That would be really cool. It is really cool. And I'm glad you brought up Solar United Neighbors. That's sort of the second uh, big opportunity that I see for the industry. So the industry just hit a milestone of reaching 5 million homeowners mm -hmm. with residential solar. Yeah. And Solar United Neighbors has built a membership organization with over a million solar customers uh, who are part of this organization. So uh, they are organizing those customers to work on net metering legislation, yeah. to work on passing a uh, solar app in local areas um, and other clean energy and solar related local policy. Yeah. Uh, so they're showing up to public utility commission hearings. 
uh, they're writing letters to their uh, members of Congress and mm -hmm. their state legislators. Like they're really engaging because they've got skin in the game. Yeah. Right. And again, this sort of ties to the theory of change. The more people who are benefiting from it, the deeper and broader the base of support for the transition will be. So Solar United Neighbors is just this incredibly exciting mm -hmm. opportunity where, you know, we can organize over a million people who are benefiting from it uh, to be advocates and enable other people to benefit from it. And, you know, we're, I think Solar United Neighbors has a path to get to over 2 million members mm -hmm. this year. Amazing. And now most of the industry is is actually memorizing their new customers into Solar into United that. Neighbors going forward. So, you know, this is an organization that will add five, 600,000 new members every year uh, and build a very, very large and powerful base of support. Coalition. Coalition that we've never had before. Yeah. It's, uh, it's really cool to see full circle. You know, 20 years ago, the work you did with these students, these early job seekers, who now, many of them have solar on their homes. They're part of this, this literal energy action coalition. Yeah. Is there anything that you feel like you've still left on the table, still got left to do? One other important initiative uh, that we've been involved with for a couple years as it's been in formation is called ReCheck. 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 Okay. And it was, it's being driven by Ohm Analytics. Mm, yeah. And it's a national registry for solar installers and solar salespeople. Similar to in the mortgage industry, you need to get a certification and a license to sell uh, to broker mortgages. Right. So we're building something similar for residential solar where that can bring kind of a transparency and accountability to who's selling. Yeah. That's happening in parallel with a process that SIA is working on to create a set of standards. So there will be a national set of standards for solar sales and solar installation mm. that the installers and the salespeople will need to get certified and yeah. registered. And then they'll be tracked through the recheck registry. Yeah. And, you know, this is a maturing industry. Yeah. And, uh, you know, when there were a small number of installations and salespeople, yeah. you know, it, it sort of didn't matter. States had their own processes for it. But I think we're at a point and at at a scale as an industry where having that kind of standardization, having those uh, certification processes, having the accountability for everybody involved, is going to be just a healthy, uh, uh, helpful thing for the industry. So we're a founding partner of Recheck. Uh, it's going to be a requirement yeah. for installers and salespeople on our platform that they're certified um, and. Most of the rest of the big players in the industry are getting behind it right now. Yeah. And I think it's awesome. I love that. I didn't know about that. I learned something new right here in this moment. When you're not thinking about how to save our energy infrastructure, what do you nerd out about? I love taking my dog for long walks in nature. Mm -hmm. That's probably uh, that and yoga are the two things that are, I think, most helping me heal right now. Do you do yoga every day? Uh, probably every other day. Mm -hmm. uh, I also take a bath or sauna mm -hmm. almost every day. Ice bath? Uh, no, just warm, comfy bath. <laughs> um, and so I'm trying to spend as much time in nature as possible. I feel like that's the that greatest bath, inspiration. Yeah. 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 Mm. I'm wondering who inspires you? The work that my wife is doing is inspiring me every day. And it's, uh, she runs the Wahala John, she runs the office of Indian energy at the department of energy. So she's the point person on supporting the 574 federally recognized tribes in the U S to develop their energy vision. So they do, funding and technical assistance and policy work to uh, 
support these tribes. So she's traveling all around the country, meeting with tribes, hearing what they want to achieve and helping them do it. And it's just unbelievably inspiring work. Well, in the capacity of uh, industry ambassador, I appreciate all the work that you're doing. I know others are going to want in some way to reach out and follow you. Is there a particular social media platform that you favor? How do you like to be uh, reached if you are reachable? Billy at joinmosaic.com works. Yeah. Uh, I love hearing from people in the industry yeah. and uh, trying to stay off social media. What will have changed as a result of the work that you are doing? It goes back to the theory of change. I, I hope that millions of people have been brought into this movement yeah. in some good way, uh, either as an activist, as a solar homeowner, um, as an installer partner who we've supported, an investor, um, Mm. uh, and that then they find their own path to continue doing the work. So, you know, I love being able to sort of support, enable Mm. um, uh, as many people as possible to be part of this good work. Well, I am certain that the work that you have done and will continue to do has impacted Many people, I'm one of them. I'm grateful for the opportunity to get this FaceTime with you. Thanks for thanks for investing into our collective tribe. Thank you for everything that you've done for this industry as well. I'm an admirer and glad that we finally got time to do this. And if you would like to learn more from Billy and his peers, Every single week, we try our best to get leaders like Billy to share what's happening inside their heads and how they were crazy enough to take the risk to build this industry that you enjoy, either as a founder, as a follower, as an aspirant, as someone aspiring to have a career in this sector. We've got more than 700 episodes in our back catalog at mysandcast.com. I hope that you will subscribe, but more than that, I hope that you will put it to action because listening is just the beginning. The next step is to take proactive steps. Build your business, build your career, build your tribe with us. Join this community. And I hope that you'll take a moment to thank Billy. Please email him, uh, reach out, let him know how much it means that not only he did this work, but that he came here to share it with us. And last, thank you for coming here to share your time with us. I'm grateful for our sponsors who help underwrite this activity so that all I have to ask you to pay is attention. Hope that you'll give us more of it and show up next week for yet another founder story here on the front lines of the clean energy transition. In the meantime, remember you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solar Warrior. It's half the battle.